Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. Happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 99 of Left Side of the Aisle. Woohoo. Uh, I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. For the next almost half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you at various things important to me and that I think are worthy of your attention. If you have any reactions to the show, they can, they should be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W H O V I A T I N G, at AOL.com. And since I'm sure you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, the address for which will be around here a couple of times during the show. Uh, you can go there, you can get the email address from there. Uh, please, though, when you send me email, please be sure to include something like left side of the aisle or, or your cable show or something like that uh, in the subject line so I know it's not spam. And please be a little patient. I do answer my mail, sometimes a little slow about it, but I do answer it. All right, let's get right to it. I'm going to start with a, an item that I wanted to, wanted to do because I had kind of a whole set of different reactions to it and uh, wanted to run this down and see if maybe some of you had sort of the same kind of reactions. Uh, Marco McMillian, 34 years old, he was found dead last week at a levee at the Mississippi River. Now McMillian, who is both black and openly gay, was considered a viable candidate for mayor of Clarksburg, Clarksdale, rather, Mississippi, which is a town of 20-something thousand in the northwest corner of the state, which uh, is notable primarily for having some connection to the history of the blues. Police have charged a 22-year-old man named Lawrence Reed with the murder in the case. Now, no motive has been established, but McMillian's godfather, a man named uh, Carter Womack, said the county coroner told uh, McMillian's family that his body had been beaten and burned. Now, when I first heard about this, my reaction, and I know it was the reaction of at least some other people, was, oh, please do not let this be what it looks like. Let it be a robbery gone bad. Let, let it be some kind of if you'll pardon the expression, ordinary tragedy, rather than the vicious hate crime that it appeared to be. Let it, let it be this base motive instead of that baser motive. Uh, but at the same time as that, the same time as that, a thought kept running through my head. An openly gay black man was a viable candidate for mayor in Mississippi. An openly gay black man was a viable candidate for mayor in Mississippi. An openly gay black man was a viable candidate for mayor in Mississippi. We know, oh, how we know how much, far, how much farther we have to go, <coughs> Trayvon Martin. <laughs> but sometimes it's good to stop for just a moment and to contemplate a little how far we actually have come. All right, from one tragedy to another sort of tragedy, if you will, uh, our regular weekly feature, the Clown Award, given for acts of meritorious stupidity. In this case, the Clown Award, the big red nose, goes to the financial professionals, the masters of the universe, who populate the banks and brokerage houses of Wall Street. About one in three American workers, and this is all workers, this is the entire workforce, about one in three American workers said in a survey conducted by the American Psychological Association a couple of months ago that they work in a job that is too stressful or doesn't pay enough. Uh, nearly 30% told a Gallup survey uh, last August that uh, they felt that their pay was, well, they, they were not happy with their pay, they were dissatisfied with their pay. Oh, but those Wall Street folks, they do live in a different universe. They do live in a different dimension. More than two-thirds of them told a recent survey by a recruiting firm called uh, Selby Jennings that they were unsatisfied with their pay package for 2012. And how much do these poor, underpaid peons get? Their average income last year, their average income last year was $363,000. That is more than $300,000. That's like more than eight times 
the median household income in the United States in 2012. And in fact, you got to remember that average, that median household, because some households have multiple wage earners, that median household has more than one wage, more than one wage earner. But oh, the poor people on Wall Street, they're so underpaid, they're so underappreciated. They are whiny, greedy, grasping clowns. All right, from there, a couple of things uh, going to go on to, to um, the uh, updates. We've got some updates here, and um, I'm sort of missing the first one, so we'll go on to a different one and get back to the first one. Question, do you remember this? Do you remember this? This is the uh, Deepwater Horizon. Remember the Deepwater Horizon disaster? Um, BP is already on the hook for tens of billions of dollars in fines and other payouts as a result of its part in this disaster. It killed 11 workers and uh, fouled the Gulf of Mexico and hundreds of miles of the Gulf Coast. Um, it's now facing, BP is now facing a trial where the federal government, Gulf states, and some individuals are looking for civil damages, additional civil damages, which could total nearly $20 billion. This trial is expected to last for several months, and um, so I was going to bring it up in April, actually, uh, because April next month is the third anniversary of the Deepwater Horizon disaster. I was going to bring it up next month, but I decided that um, this is just too good. Too good to wait. On February 26th, on the second day of the trial, Lamar McKay, the president of BP America at the time of the explosion, admitted in his testimony that, quoting him, there is a risk identified for a blowout. The blowout was an identified risk and it was a big risk. Yes. In fact, internal BP documents show that the month before the blowout, the company had struggled with a loss of well control at the site and for months before that had been expressing concern about the, uh, the, uh, the blowout preventer and the well casing, which are the very things that led to, that triggered the disaster that actually happened. In other words, BP knew, they knew for months before this happened that it was a real big risk and they did nothing. McKay was asked if he had been uh, asked or told to choose cost over safety. After a long pause, his answer was, not explicitly. I think we can well imagine what he was told implicitly. Okay, uh, hopefully you remember this person. His name is Bradley Manning. And uh, he's the Army private who is now being court-martialed uh, for crimes up to and including aiding the enemy for daring to be a whistleblower and revealing via WikiLeaks uh, uh, real U.S. foreign policy and what the U.S. is actually up to in Iraq. He's being court-martialed after being held in solitary confinement for over a year in what appears to have been an unsuccessful attempt to break him so that he would testify against Julian Assange, who was the director of WikiLeaks. Now, I should do, I've been meaning to do a real update on this trial and everything that's happened with it, uh, but for now, this brief update is going to have to do. Manning has pleaded guilty to 10 of the 22 charges against them. He basically to the 10 least serious charges. Uh, all of these 10 charges involve unauthorized release of classified documents of some document or group of documents with each document or group being a separate charge. In effect, he's acknowledged what everybody else already assumed. He was the source for WikiLeaks. He's not pleading guilty to the other charges, or he's, I should say he's pleading not guilty to the other charges. These include not only aiding the enemy, violations of the Espionage Act, and various accusations of having stolen the documents, which is really kind of a silly accusation considering these are computer files and the original files are still right where they were. Now, seemingly in exchange for, for this plea, 
Uh, the judge in charge of the court martial, one Colonel Denise Lind, allowed Manning to read into the record a 35 page statement describing what he did, why he did it, how he came to do it. Now, contrary to what you might think from a 35 page statement, this was no um, rambling manifesto like the Unabomber or something. It was actually a rather tight chronology of his career as a soldier what he did, what he learned, and how what he learned moved him to do what he did. Uh, in the course of which, by the way, he noted that he originally offered these documents to the Washington Post and the New York Times, and neither one was interested. There's going to be a link to his statement. If you want to see this whole statement, uh, there'll be a link to it. It's worth reading. It's long, but it's worth reading. There'll be a link to it up on my website when the video of this week's show is posted. And by the way, one other thing. For the third year in a row, Bradley Manning has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, I can't give him that, but I can give him my Hero Award. The award that I give to people who, in some way, big or small, just do the right thing. All right, our last update. I told you last week that Antonin Scalia is a thoroughgoing scumbag. Uh, but now we have more evidence of just how thoroughgoing he is. At the Supreme Court on March 5th, Scalia told his fellow justices how privileged he felt for being on the court because I can say stuff here that got me fired at Kinko's. He then went on to relate this charming anecdote about how he briefly worked at Kinko's in the mid-1970s. And quoting him, it seemed like every time I opened my mouth I got hauled into HR, which is human resources, where the gal told him, you can't just go around insulting blacks and women and whatnot. There's not a workplace in the country that will tolerate that. Well, guess what? He concluded with a chuckle. She was right until I got this job. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia chuckling with glee over his freedom to offend gays, minorities, and women, and nobody can do anything about it. He's truly a scumbag. And by the way, now I hope you understand why I said he's ineligible for the Clown Award because it would be unfair to the other candidates. All right, now, speaking, though, of the, of the Hero Award, which I was in the case of Bradley Manning, we have an edition of the Hero Award this week. It goes to Google. Now, Google's corporate motto supposedly is don't be evil, although they have been evil in things like their dealings with the Chinese government and so on, but never mind. This week, they get the Hero Award. Google has revealed that the FBI has used national security letters, or NSLs, to see secretly seek information on Google users. NSLs, what these are, these national security letters, these were created by the Patriot Act. They are extrajudicial demands for information which are issued by the FBI. They are not issued, overseen, double-checked, approved, or whatever by any court. They can demand personal information from, among other things, internet service providers, phone companies, banks and other financial institutions, and credit companies. Now, civil liberties groups have attacked this. The ACLU has mounted legal challenges against a portion of the Patriot Act that, that, uh, that allows for this. The Electronic Privacy Information Center calls these things extraordinary, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation calls them frightening and invasive. What makes these NSLs particularly evil is that the outfit that receives such a letter can be barred from ever mentioning it ever got one. The FBI admits to having issued 16,511 national security letters in 2011, the last year for which there's any information. But that's all we know, that total number. How can we, how can we as citizens perform any kind of citizen oversight, any citizen reasonable judgment on a program when you can't even know what's happening except in the aggregate? Well, what's happened in this particular case is that Google managed to negotiate with the government to get permission to release some limited information. It's still in the aggregate. 
All we know is that in each of the last four years, Google got less than 1,000 national security letters, which involves somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 customers, customer accounts. Uh, as David Kravitz at, the, at Wired Magazine wrote, apparently the terrorists would win if Google told you the exact number of times the FBI had demanded information about its customers. Now this release, Google's release, is only a small step, but still, it, it, it shows you know, some privacy. And this actually shows just how pervasive uh, the Obama administration's commitment to secrecy is. This small step has been called by some privacy experts an unprecedented win for transparency. So yes, it is a small step. But the fact is, Google took it, and they are the only technology company which has. So, good on Google, and we're taking a break. And, uh, hi, welcome back. Um, something showed up recently that uh, some climatologists, uh, you know, people who study climate, are calling one of the scariest things they've seen in a long time. This graph. This graph. Now, I know all of you out there looking at that graph and they're being like Count Floyd on SCTV going, ooh, scary. So let me explain to you what's scary about this graph. But to do that, we have to back up a little bit. Back in 1999, a climatologist at Penn State University named Michael Mann published the results of a study which he had led looking to establish an historical record of the temperatures for the Northern Hemisphere dating back as far as 1,500 years. Now, obviously, temperature records don't go back that far. In fact, they only go back to about the 1880s. But what he did is he used what are called proxies. These are things, uh, for example, tree rings, that can be used to indicate temperature and, and climate within a given year, at least give you a rough idea of what the temperature would have been. The graph he produced was this one. Now, this became known as the hockey stick graph uh, because, um, you know, kind of a superficial a kind of a superficial uh, resemblance to a hockey stick with a long shaft with a sharply angled blade at the end. And that blade actually starts appearing right around the uh, Industrial Revolution of the latter 1800s. In other words, just about the time that people really started to pour a lot more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Now this graph and Dr. Mann's personal reputation became targets for the nanny nanny naysayers on climate change who claimed that the entire case for uh, human driven climate change rested on this graph, which it didn't and it doesn't, but never mind that. Uh, they, the point is they said about trying to demolish this graph and Dr. Mann's reputation along with it. Well, unfortunately for them, several follow-up studies using different combinations of researchers, using different combinations of proxies, uh, repeated this study, and they all came to basically the same conclusion. The shaft of the stick got sort of warped, but the blade, that sharp upturn, is still there in all of these studies. All right, with that background, let's go back to the ooh, scary graph. This was published last week in the peer-reviewed uh, scientific journal, Science. Now, if you notice on, on the right, your right, the part closer to me, where it says previous time frame, that's the time frame covered by all these previous studies, which is about 1,500 to 2,000 years back. This graph uses an additional method uh, involving a chemical marker found in fossilized ocean shells. This reconstructs temperatures in the northern hemisphere going back over 11,000 years. That is, in other words, about as long as there has been agriculture. And what this graph shows is that we have lurched, we have skyrocketed out, out of a several thousand year long cooling trend to the point where the northern hemisphere has warmed as much in the last hundred years as it cooled in the previous 7,000. This rate of change is simply unprecedented. Sean Marcotte of Oregon State University, who was the lead author on the study that produced this graph, he said, we've never seen anything this rapid. Now, 
let's be clear about a couple of things. One, the graph also indicates that at the beginning of this most recent cooling trend, this is about 7,000 years ago, the northern hemisphere might have been about as warm, more or less, a little less, uh, whatever, but about as warm as it is now. Um, and the trough, the low point of that earlier cooling period, that's, you know, that far end of the graph, um, that cooling, that cool was about as cool as the trough of this more recent cooling period. So it was about as cool, about as warm. Here's the difference, and here's where the scary part comes in. That earlier warming trend from the trough to the peak took 4,000 years. We have warmed that much, or maybe a little more, in 100 years, and we are still getting warmer. So there are two points to make from this graph. One, has it been this warm before any time since the dawn of agriculture? Probably, at least almost. But the last time this happened, Plants, animals, people, society had 4,000 years to adapt and prepare and adjust. We basically have no time at all. And second, we are now facing climatic conditions which have not existed since before the dawn of agriculture. Since the time we're facing conditions that the world had not seen since before a time when there were just a couple of million human beings and a handful of them in the fertile crescent between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers were just beginning to establish settled communities. We are literally moving into unknown territory with the fate of tens of millions of people at stake. And yes, that is scary. All right, last thing for this week. Last thing for this week, or um, the outrage of the week, our other regular weekly feature. Now, you surely know about Senator Rand Paul's Mr. Smith Goes to Washington 13-hour filibuster against the nomination of John Brennan to head the CIA. Now, my own response was that I would never thought the words right on Rand Paul would cross my lips, but there they were. Um, as Cenk Uger of the Young Turks put it, just because I disagree with Rand Paul about 90% of the issues, does that mean I have to disagree with him about the other 10%? Or as one of my favorite old sayings puts it, if it's the truth, what does it matter who said it? Now, unless, you know, I could not, I still can't imagine why lefties are supposed to be uh, supporting John Brennan. I can't imagine. Now, this is a man who was involved in either bungling or deliberately distorting the intelligence in the run-up to the Iraq war, who endorsed torture, and is the architect of Obama's drone policy, which he called ethical and just. But still, Brennan was the target of the, um, of the filibuster. But the bigger question, the bigger issue, the purpose of the filibuster was to force the White House to give a direct answer to the question of, is Obama claiming to have the authority to use lethal military force, particularly drones, against Americans on American soil without any due process or oversight? In the case of Anwar al-Awlaki, um, he's already claimed to have that power. In the case of Americans living abroad, and you also consider that the National Defense Authorization Act. This provides for the authority to imprison anyone suspected of being, I'm quoting, a part of or having substantially supported Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or other or associated forces, unquote, whatever substantially supported and associated forces might mean. But any such person can be imprisoned indefinitely without trial or charge. So given those two things, the question naturally arose, well, what are the limits of authority here? What are the limits of power here? If, uh, are there any? When Alaki was killed, this was three years ago, I asked, with that bright red line, with that bright red line, in this case, the killing of an American citizen far from any battlefield, without any due process. Once that bright red line has been crossed, what is the impenetrable barrier to doing the same thing here? Paul was demanding an answer to that question. Unfortunately, he didn't get one. 
Despite the blather and the bluster of the supposedly liberal pundits and, and bloggers, uh, all those who have shown themselves every bit as much prisoners to the desire for partisan advantage as the right wing, um, all those who mock Paul, and yeah, I'm looking at you, Lawrence O'Donnell and, and uh, David Korn and Ed Schultz, uh, all those, despite all those liberal members of the Senate who brushed it off as a distraction of some kind, and I'm looking at you, Max Baucus and Claire McCaskill and Carl Levin and Bernie Sanders, Despite all of that, and contrary to a lot of them's uh, claim and the media echoed, Attorney General Eric Holder did not disclaim presidential authority to kill Americans on American soil. The claim that he did arose from a snarky letter that, uh, that uh, he sent to Paul during the filibuster. It read, in full, it has come to my attention that you have now asked an additional question. Does the president have the authority to use a weaponized drone to kill an American not engaged in combat on American soil? The answer to that question is no. Now even Paul claimed victory over this, although I suspect that was more to give him an out, a way to back out of the filibuster without backing down. Um, but what I've been saying to everybody who would listen, what does this mean? Have we forgotten how slippery the phrase in combat has become? Glenn Greenwald, he's a, he's a constitutional author, a, a lawyer rather, and an, and an author, noted the Olaki assassination was justified, I'm quoting him, on the ground that Olaki was a combatant, that he was engaged in combat, even though he was killed not while making bombs or shooting anyone, but after he had left a cafe where he'd had breakfast. If the Obama administration believes that Olaki was engaged in combat at that time, and it clearly does, then Holder's letter is meaningless at best and menacing at worst, because in effect, it says, it endorses a standard so broad that it includes the authority that people are now saying he denied. Plus the fact that, remember, the NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, essentially defines anyone in al Qaeda, the Taliban, or supported them, or any associated force, again, whatever that means, as engaged in hostilities against the United States. And one other thing here, one other thing, this is important. This has nothing to do with Obama's intentions. It has nothing to do with his desire to drone American citizens. Um, he may have no desire to do it. He may refuse to do it if the occasion arose. The issue is not whether or not he would use such authority. The issue is, does it exist? Because even if you're prepared to say, as a lot of liberal pundits I've heard say, I trust this president, are you prepared to trust every future president? Now, the Obama administration has not specifically declared that he has the authority to kill Americans on American soil, but um, they have gone out of their way to avoid saying he doesn't have it. And whatever you want to make of that, I consider it an outrage. We're going to wrap up this week with one last thing. As of, uh, as of yesterday, 2,635 Americans have been killed by guns since Newtown, 17 of them in Massachusetts. That's it for this week. We're going to see you next week with a special 100th show. Um, look forward to that and have the best week you can.